Now, let's, now we'll get into the into the seminar and we'll welcome up our guest speaker, Dr. Mark Sandoval. Thank you very much. All right, well, welcome. It's a pleasure to be here with you and Ava. And um, I am hailing all the way from Kabul. <laughs> so not too far away. Uh, we did drive and we make it. Um, usually I'm farther away from home when I'm doing a series, but um, it's good to be here and closer to home and to be somewhat local and in this area. So it's a privilege to be here and to be with you. Uh, just by ways of uh, introductions, my name is uh, Mark Sandoval. I am a medical doctor. My background training is emergency medicine, lifestyle medicine, um, but I've also spent lots of time in counseling. And in fact, um, currently I'm not doing ER and I have somewhat retired from lifestyle medicine, but I'm primarily focusing on counseling and helping individuals work through uh, their struggles, their mental health challenges, relationship issues, and, and uh, other things of that nature. And I think we've got a short, <clears throat> rather than a long, there we go. Uh, I'll try a different pocket and see if that helps. And, um, and uh, I, we have uh, six children, um, uh, six biological children. Four of us are, 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 four of them are here with us right now. Um, and uh, the oldest one is in Alabama studying at a health institute, uh, being a lifestyle counselor, and uh, the other one is working on a farm in Oklahoma and enjoying his time there ranching and farming and doing that kind of stuff. And uh, then my wife and, and the other children are right here in the back. Um, so they'll be joining us for at least some of the meetings, maybe not all of them. Some of them get tired going back and forth every day. but. Um, we'll, we'll make it. We're glad to be here. Pleasure to be here. Um, a, a number of the topics that we're going to be talking about today and tomorrow and Saturday and Monday and Tuesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday, uh, we're not meeting on Sundays or Wednesdays, um, but we'll be meeting uh, every other day. It's at 6 o'clock, of course, during the weekdays, and it'll be at 1 o'clock on Saturdays. So. Um, it will be 6 o'clock today, 6 o'clock tomorrow, 1 o'clock on Saturday. Um, we have to work around the existing schedule for this building. And, uh, and then again next week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday will be 6 o'clock, and Friday will be 6 o'clock, and then Saturday will be 1 o'clock. And um, we're going to be talking about to um, topics that are going to look at getting to the roots of the issues that we struggle with. <coughs> Not just the superficial stuff, but really getting to the roots. And uh, again, as was mentioned, if you have questions and uh, we don't have the time to get to those questions during Q&A time, um, or if you've been sitting and, and it's been fomenting in your mind for a while and you want to put it down on, you know, a written form or whatever, then just, um, you know, let somebody know in the back here and then they'll get a card for you and something to write with so that you can... Uh, write those questions down and we'll try to answer everything that we can. And um, it is my habit to pray before I begin and so I'm going to do so. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings and we thank you for health and we thank you for um, <clears throat> lots of good things. But there's a lot of bad and evil too and we need to understand that as well. And uh, so <coughs> as we come together, uh, we seek to understand things so that it makes sense and so that we can be free. And so we ask for that help in understanding and in being free. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. When we um, look at our particular topic, this thing does not move unless you have the proper devices plugged in where they're supposed to be plugged in. Um, <clears throat> that in and of itself is a lesson. Things only work the way they're created to work. Um, and we're going to begin by looking at health. And we're going to begin by looking at health with a few analogies. Um, other things out there in nature can give us an idea of how other things function as well, because there's a lot of similarities in nature. 
And so we're just going to look at a tree, a simple tree. When you walk up to a tree, what is it that's the first thing that you notice about a tree? Leaves. Leaves, okay. Yeah? Shape size. All right, the size or the shape of the tree. All right. All right, the trunk or the bark, uh, especially if it's quite interesting variety. Uh, species. What's that? Species. Okay, what species it is, right? If you if you know, um, if you don't, you scratch your head. <laughs> what is it that you usually don't notice first about a tree? The roots. The roots. Right. That's not what you usually notice. Now there are uh, notable exceptions to that. Uh, our family lived in Trinidad in uh, the Caribbean for a while, and uh, I worked in a hospital down there. And uh, there was a botanical gardens that was near where we were at, and it had a huge tree with these huge branches. And from those branches came huge roots yeah. that came down from the branches all the way to the ground. Then you pay attention to the roots. Right? Well, in our analogy with the tree, you can have good fruit and good leaves, or you can have bad fruit and bad leaves, and the very noticeable things that when it comes to health is symptoms. Everybody notices symptoms. If you've got pain, you know you've got pain. If you're coughing, you know you're coughing. If you've got an itch, you know you've got an itch. When you've got a sore throat, you know you've got a sore throat. When your nose is running, sometimes you have to catch up. Right? And, uh, and so when you've got symptoms, you know that you've got symptoms. It's quite obvious. And what do we usually do for symptoms? Okay, so we'll treat the symptoms. How do we usually treat the symptoms? <laughs> All right. So, so we take something. Right. Uh, in this case, it might be a pill. That pill might contain a medication. It might contain an herb. It might contain a supplement. It might contain grass. It, who knows? Right. It might be a placebo and sugar, which is not a placebo actually. Um, and uh, it might have something in there. And we take that in order to treat our symptoms. Now, let's imagine that your symptom is back pain, and that back pain's right there between your shoulder blades. Oh, it's killing you, it's sharp, it's stabbing, you can't lay on your back, it's really uncomfortable. And, and so, you know, you, you take something, Tylenol, ibuprofen, Aleve, something of that nature, and it just takes a little bit off of, the, off of the pain, but it's still really bad, and you can't lay on your back, and it's really painful, and, and so on. So, you try some more, it's still not working, you go to see your doctor. The doctor gives you a prescription for a medication that's stronger, right? And, and so you take the stronger medication, and of course you keep taking the, the other one that you were taking too, because you want to double up because you're going to get this pain taken care of, and the pain still continues, it's better, not quite as bad, but it's still there. And then, all right, what do you do? You go back, oh, doc, it's still killing me, I still can't lay on my back. And, Okay, well, let's write you for a prescription that's stronger, all right? And, uh, and so now you have a stronger medication, and you still have the pain. It's not quite as bad. Uh, you get a little bit drowsy, and you can get some bits of sleep, and so on, but it's still really painful. And you're like, oh, forget this. I'm going to get a second opinion. So you go to another doctor, and that doctor says, hmm, let's check things out. <laughs> There's a reason you've got back pain. You got four friends. You got a knife in your back. Actually, you got four, four really good friends. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, did the pill take away the problem? No. No. Even if it would have taken away the pain so that you didn't have pain anymore and the symptom was gone, does that mean that it took care of the cause? No. No. It didn't take care of the cause. If you had a tree that had bad leaves and bad fruit, if you simply plucked off the bad fruit and the bad leaves, would you have fixed the problem? No. no, you wouldn't have. Because the problem lies deeper than that. Now, symptoms are a manifestation of something that is deeper. The manifestation is not the problem. It's not the problem. In fact, the manifestation can be part of the solution. For example, is this a problem? No. All right. A fire alarm is not a problem. What is the problem? The fire. 
The fire that's burning the house down is the problem. Right? The fire alarm is not the problem. So if you have a fire alarm, your symptoms, going off because there's a fire, and your solution to the fire alarm, because you were you know, sleeping and wanting to get your rest and all that kind of stuff, and now it's waking you up, it's annoying, you know, the alarm's going off, and you want to go back to sleep, so you get a pillow <laughs> and put it over the fire alarm. And, well, you don't want to stand there holding it, so you get some duct tape, and you tape it in place, and now it's instead of ring, you know, so, and now you can go back to sleep. Great, you fixed the problem, right? No. No, not so much, right? not so much. Because right? the problem is not the fire alarm, the problem is not the symptoms, the problem is the thing that caused it. So we've got to get deeper. Do the fruit and the, and the, and the leaves grow by themselves? No. No, what do they grow on? Nutrients. Okay, so there's nutrients. How are the nutrients going to get to the fruit and the leaves? Roots. All right, so <clears throat> eventually, but you usually don't pick fruit off of roots. You pick fruit off of branches. Branches, that's right. So the branches represent our behaviors, our actions. They, these are very similar. You know, everybody has the same behaviors and actions. Everybody's got to breathe, everybody's got to drink, everybody's got to eat, and so on. And those actions or those behaviors, if you have good behaviors, are they going to support good fruit and good leaves? Or bad fruit and bad leaves? Good support. Good, yeah, good, good fruit and good leaves. If you have bad behaviors, you think that's going to end up with good fruit and good leaves or bad fruit and bad leaves? Bad fruit and bad leaves. If you've got bad branches, you're going to end up with bad fruit as well. So behaviors are important. What you breathe, what you drink, what you eat, how you do it, how often you do it, and so on. It's important. It is. <clears throat> but is it the end-all be-all? No. Because the branches don't even grow by themselves. What do the branches grow off of? The trunk. And the trunk represents our needs. You need what you need because you are what you are. You need what you need because you are what you are. If you were a rock, well, your needs would be a little different. If you were a salamander, your needs would be a little different than they are. If you were a frog, well, it'd be similar to the salamander, but just slightly different. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the frog needs food, but the frog can live off of worms. Can you live off of worms? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> well, we found out the hard way that there's only certain birds that can survive off of worms. Because we had uh, a certain species of bird where the babies were, well, actually, somebody else, the bird had made a nest on somebody else's porch and, and uh, they found it abandoned, which wasn't abandoned, but anyways, they brought it to us. And, and so then we had birds, little babies that we had to feed. And the, the only thing we had available to us was a garden with lots of worms in it. And so we started feeding worms. And then the little babies started dying. And oh, so sad for the, you know, the children and everything. And, and uh, we're trying to figure out what's going on. And so we start looking online and we realize most birds cannot handle worms because they have certain types of bacteria in them and that will produce a, a toxin that will paralyze. And they'll paralyze and stop breathing and all that kind of stuff. And so we figured that out and we quickly switched and started getting crickets and other things like that. And one of them made it. And we raised it and you know let it go and all that kind of stuff. It was nice. But so <clears throat> you couldn't survive off the worms either. Yes, you need food, but you need a certain type of food. So what you are determines what you need. And what do you need? Well, you need oxygen, you need water, you need food, you need sunlight, and so on. <clears throat> Why do you breathe? Stay alive. <laughs> That's good. Stay alive. You breathe because you need oxygen. Why do you drink? Because you need water. Why do you eat? 
Because you need food, right? Your behaviors are there in order to supply what you need. Now, everything you need comes from where? Inside or from outside? outside? From outside of you. So you need oxygen, but if the oxygen stays right there at your mouth and nose, are you going to live or die? die. You're going to die. The only way you'll live is if you bring it in, you breathe, and it becomes a part of you. Only when it comes in and becomes a part of you, then you can live by the thing that you need. It can't support your life if it's close. It can only support your life if it's inside. Okay? And the water, well, the water's outside of you, and you'll die if it stays right there at your lips. I mean, you can have nice and moist lips on the outside, but the rest of you is dead because it's only, you're only going to live if you drink it and take it in, and then it becomes a part of you. So, can you change what you need? No, you can't change what you need. Now, you can think that you can change what you need, and you can think that you don't need oxygen anymore, but you'll find out really quickly <laughs> that's not going to work. You can hold your breath all you want to, but guess what? You're going to pass out, and then you're going to start breathing again. And then you're going to wake up and go, oh, what happened? <laughs> well, you need oxygen, and you need water, and you need food, and you can't change that. You need what you need, and you need it in certain quantities, and, and so on. So what if your behaviors do not match your needs? Is that going to end up with good fruit, good leaves, or bad fruit, bad leaves? It's going to end up with bad fruit, bad leaves. The only way you're going to end up with good fruit and good leaves is if your behaviors properly supply what you need. And what you need cannot change. So if anything's going to change, it has to be what you do, right? how you behave in supplying that what you need. So you need oxygen. The oxygen is not going to blow into you. You've got to breathe. Right? You need water. The water's not going to squirt down you. You're, you've got to drink. And you need food, and the food's not going to walk down your throat. If it does, that was not a good choice. <laughs> and you must eat, right? You must eat. So everything first takes in what it needs. But what would happen if you kept everything you took? What would happen if every meal you had, you still have? And every drink you took, you still have. And every breath you brought in, you still have. How big would you be? We would not be having this meeting in this room. Because not one of us would fit. So you take, but you then pass on almost everything that you took. And eventually, if you take the life cycle of an individual, you pass on everything that you took. Because uh, you started as a little thing, and you end up as a dirty thing at the end. Right? Well, you know, decomp decomposition and so on, and you become food for something else, like those worms that you can't eat, but they can eat you. <laughs> so everything takes in first what it needs, but then it passes away and, and passes along what it took, and that, what you pass along, supports the life and the function of other things. <clears throat> so, you can't change what you need. Everything that you need comes from outside of you, and it's by your own behaviors that you bring in what you need so that you can live. Does the trunk grow by itself? No. Huh. Where does the trunk grow from? Roots. Roots, okay. And the roots represent our beliefs. You don't necessarily know what an individual believes until... You dig. Sometimes you have to dig. You've got to ask questions. You've got to spend time. You've got to listen, and so on. And, and when you spend enough time, you begin to understand what somebody believes. Now, there is a way to know what somebody believes by how they behave. Because you will do what you believe. And if you believe that you believe it, but you have the opportunity and don't do it, 
you don't really believe it. And if you don't believe, you believe it, but when the opportunity comes, you do it. You believe it. I like it. I think on that one. I believe that. <laughs> What's that? I believe that. Yeah. <laughs> so, let's say you believe that you need Dr. Pepper. If you believe that you need Dr. Pepper, what are you going to do? You're going to drink Dr. Pepper. It was my favorite soft drink when I was younger. Right? Um, so you're going to drink Dr. Pepper. But do you actually need Dr. Pepper? No. No, you don't need Dr. Pepper. So if you believe you need it, but you don't need it, and you provide what you don't need, is that going to end up with good fruit and good leaves or bad fruit and bad leaves? Oh, it'll end up with bad fruit and bad leaves. Because if you supply what you don't need, well, the system's not going to work very well that way. If, if you pour uh, diesel instead of water on the plant, well, I'm not sure how many of them are going to survive and haven't met one yet. Especially when after you do that, then you light the lighter, <laughs> Boy Scout juice, <coughs> and, uh, and you watch it go up in flames, right? Um, so, what you believe is very important because that directs what you do and that supplies what you need. But this cannot change. That is like the fulcrum on a teeter-totter. Right? The fulcrum is the point, the point that doesn't move. Everything else moves around it. That point that doesn't move is your needs. That's fixed. So the beliefs are only going to do you really good if the beliefs match the needs. Because then your behaviors are going to provide what you need, and then you're going to be able to end up with good fruit and good leaves rather than the bad fruit and the bad leaves. But if you have a tree that has bad fruit and bad leaves, where is the problem? OK. What are you going to fix? The soil. The soil. The soil. Because the problem is your sources. The soil represents your sources. So that's where the problem is. Is your source good or is your source not good? So you can have a source that has too little of what you need. Uh, you need water, right? The tree might need water, but if there's not enough water, it's not going to do so well. Uh, you can have too much of what you need. Waterlogged, and it's not going to do so well either, unless it's one of those you know, cypress trees and so on. Um, but, and if you have the wrong stuff, it's not going to work so well either. Again, diesel, oil, other things of that nature, that, the tree's not going to work off of that. You've got to have the right stuff. So if you've got too little, if you've got too much, if you've got the wrong stuff, then you're going to end up with problems, and that's going to manifest in bad fruit and bad leaves. And if all you do is pluck off the bad fruit by bad leaves by treating the symptoms, then you haven't fixed the cause. Right? Haven't gotten to the cause. <clears throat> How many here do not need love? All right. So good. We're still at 100%. I've asked that question in many different countries and all across the states to a bunch of different audiences and except for two 14 year old male children <laughs> who raised their hands because they needed attention which is a component of love <laughs> i haven't met anybody that doesn't need love so we also need love just like we need water we need oxygen we need food we also need love but the question is, what is love? What is it? Is it physical? Well, it has physical components, right? Uh, how much does love weigh? Don't turn to your spouse and ask them. <laughs> <laughs> what is its density? Right? 
And uh, what's its molecular formula? Is there a molecular formula for it so that you can put this, that, that, and together in this particular way? And now you have whoop, love. Now, if we did, if we could, it'd be for sale on the table back there. But no, no. Can you examine it under a microscope and discover its properties by looking at it? No. Can you synthesize love in a laboratory and inject it into something that didn't have love and now it has love? No. No? Okay. So can you extract it from something until that thing that had love now doesn't have love? No. All right. So, <clears throat> what needs love? Does your chair need love? Sometimes. Okay. <laughs> no, especially after you threw it at your spouse. All right. <clears throat> Does your computer need love? No. No? But it doesn't need your hatred either. Does something physical need love? Yeah. All right. Or is it that physical things need the effects of love? Uh, all right. So, do your fingers need love? Or do your fingers need the effects of love? Uh, do your eyes need love? Or do your eyes need the effects of love? Uh, what part of you needs love? Hmm. And how do you bring in the love that you need? So these are all love. questions that we need to consider. All right, so let's say that you are having a bad day and um, and you came home, and when you came home, you stopped at the mailbox, and lo and behold, there was a letter, and it was this, this kind of letter. And it, the, the name on the front of it and the address came from a familiar address and a familiar name, and it happened to be the right name. And uh, you open it up, and it says, well, hey, I've been thinking about you, and can't get you off my mind, and thinking about the last time that we were together, and, and looking forward to, you know, spending more time together in the future, and yada, 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 and, and so on and so forth, and then it's signed, love, so-and-so, XOXO, and so on. So how do you feel after reading the letter? Right? It's the right person. Not the used car salesman downtown. <laughs> That's the right person. How do you feel? Don't push my heart. Yeah, yeah. Do, don't you feel loved? Yeah. Well, how much love was in the glue of the envelope? Any lo love in the stamp? No. Any love in the paper? No. What about the ink? It's a message. <laughs> okay. So nothing in that letter, nothing in that, actually had the substance love in it. <clears throat> but you know what that letter contained? Information. It contained information. Because you have been taught that this symbol means this thing, and this symbol means that thing, and this letter, and so on and so forth, and this number of symbols together means this word, and this word has this meaning, and these words put together has this meaning, and this group of words put together has this meaning, and what you did is you took the information, you interpreted it to mean love, and you know that it had a source, and that source wasn't you. And so by that, you took in the love. So what is the action that brings in love? It's actually thinking. Love is brought in as a process of thinking, the process of thought. <clears throat> and, uh, and so just as you need to breathe to bring in your oxygen, just as you need to drink to bring in your water, just as you need to eat to bring in the food that you need, so there is a thinking that brings in the love that you need. And uh, you can breathe badly and things don't go so well. 
and breathe really shallow, breathe not very often, and so on, and things will just not go so well. And you can eat really poorly, and things cannot go so well. And you can think not so well, and things will not go so well, because you're missing out on things that you need. <clears throat> Now what if, we're talking about sources now, what if you believe that you need love from people? Well, <clears throat> then what are you going to do? Chase people. Chase people. <clears throat> That's right, you're going to chase people. Right? You're going to plant your roots in people. <clears throat> Have you ever met a person that could meet your needs? Me either. Sorry, honey. <laughs> I can't be hers either. We tried. Didn't work. <clears throat> so, yes, there's going to be some problems if we think we need love from another person and we're going to be fulfilled by getting that love from another person. Because guess what? Do they need love or do they not need love? <laughs> they need it too. So we're going to them to get something that they need as well. It's like going to another person to get my oxygen. Is that going to work very well? No. no. If I go to another person to get my water, is that going to work very well? And to, be, to get my food? They're not going to be really happy with me. <clears throat> right? It's called cannibalism. <laughs> right? <clears throat> so, <laughs> all right. We're not going to tie this loose end right now. We're going to move on. Because cliffhangers are good for us at times. Uh, All right, so everything that functions is governed by law. There are laws that govern everything that functions and how it functions. And laws that govern function are unchangeable. You think about things like gravity. If I want to go over here and test gravity and I jump off of a chair over here, am I going to fall up or down? I'm going to fall down. And if I go over here and I get on the table and I jump off, am I going to fall up or down? down. And if I try it 3,000 times in multiple locations, which way am I going to fall? Yeah. Down. And I'm going to find out that the higher I go, the harder it is. Yeah. Yep. Oh, it might be fun coming down until you stop at the bottom. And then it's not so fun anymore. Right? So the laws that govern function are unchangeable, and proper function is only maintained by staying within the confines of the law that governs the function of whatever that thing is. And dysfunction is the result of going outside of the law. So there is a fundamental law by which we all operate. And that fundamental law has two components to it. The first component is that nothing exists or functions from itself. Nothing exists or functions from itself. That is that all things are dependent upon stuff outside of itself. You need oxygen. You need water. You need food. You need power. You need love. You need all this. So you're dependent upon resources that are outside of yourself in order for you to function and live. And that's true for everything that lives, and it's true for even things that don't live but still function. I mean, even a rock is dependent upon stuff outside of itself. Right? It is dependent upon um, heat. Right? It's dependent on an environment. It's dependent on a particular pressure and a particular temperature and so on. You get that temperature too high, guess what? Well, now you have lava. <laughs> right? and, and so on. Right? And if you get it higher, 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 you can even vaporize rock if you get the temperature high enough. Right? But also, nothing exists or functions for itself. That means that everything is going to pass on the power or the resources or other things by which it functions to other things. And other things are going to take that which was passed on and live by it and function by it as well. And this is how everything functions. This is how everything operates. This is the fundamental law. Nothing exists or functions from itself and nothing exists or functions for itself. That means that everything takes to give. That's right. Everything takes to give. And from this fundamental law, we get other fundamentals like thermodynamics. 
which tell us that all energy necessary for a system to function must come from outside. Right? So if you've got power, in order to function, that power comes from outside, it doesn't come from inside. You can't function if it's just coming from inside forever. You might have a battery that has some stored, but once that storage is used up, it's not, nothing else is going until you get some more power from the outside. And from this fundamental law comes things like cause and effect, where every effect must have a cause, and every cause produces an effect. Why? Because the effect can't produce itself, it's dependent upon power and resources outside of itself to function, and where that comes from, that's where the cause comes from. And this taking to give is what I call the law of life. Taking to give, the fundamental law of nature. And so everything functions by law to take to give. And this has implications for our health, which we're talking about tonight. But this will have very specific implications when it comes to our mental health, which we'll start talking about tomorrow and through the rest of the week, and relationships and so on. This is going to be comprehensive. So because of law and cause and effect, if you have an effect, bad fruit, bad leaves, and symptoms. And you treat the symptoms, but the cause remains. What must happen? Get worse. All right. It's either going to get worse, or it's going to turn to be different. Mm -hmm. So any treatment that does not remove the cause but only takes away the effect, must produce side effects. Yeah. Must produce side effects. By law, it must produce side effects. Because if the cause is still there, and the effect that the cause was producing is taken away, then it must produce another effect in order to manifest its presence still. Yeah. So that can be, sure, it can be medications. Right? We know medications have side effects. It can be surgery. Ever heard anybody that had side effects from surgery? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it can be herbs. People are like, huh? I thought herbs were safe. Well, they're, to the degree that they're more simple and they're whole, they are safer. But ever heard anybody had side effects with herbs? Yeah. Yeah, me too. Supplements, other things of that nature. Something that does not take care of the cause, but only takes care of the effect you're going to have side effects associated with it. All right, let's go on a journey. We're going to go on the road. This is the road of health. And on that road, things function properly, and it's comfortable. Right? There's comfort on that road. And there's certain things you need to remain on that road. You need oxygen, you need water, you need food, you need warmth, and so on. And when you get off the road, then there's dysfunction, and there's discomfort. And the farther you go, well, the worse it gets. And there is a line that defines where the edge of the road is, where when you're inside of that, you're on the road, and when you're outside of that, you're off the road, and that line is defined by law. So law defines where the edge of the road is. Now let's take warmth as our example. Let's say that um, you have a situation where your temperature is now going up above the upper level of the law. Now, how do you feel? Discomfort. All right, so now you have discomfort, right? And that particular type of discomfort we call hot. So now you feel hot or feverish. That's uncomfortable. And that, you now have symptoms. What are you going to do when you feel hot? Drink water. All right, so you might drink water, that's right. You might turn on the fan, you might turn on the air conditioning, get out of the heat, you know, something. Fan yourself, right? And you do something of that nature in order to cool down so that your temperature can get back within the confines of the law. And when the temperature is back within the confines of the law, guess what? You feel comfortable. It's great. You don't have to continue the cooling down process. 
But if it goes in the opposite direction and you get too, I was about to say it, you get too low with your temperature, then how do you feel? <coughs> cold. cold, right? And cold is uncomfortable as well. You have symptoms on the other side, and those symptoms, when you feel cool, cold, now you are motivated to do something like shiver and cover up and drink something warm and turn on the heat or other things like that so your temperature can come back up. Symptoms are like the rumble strips on the side of the road. Anybody like rumble strips? <laughs> yeah? They saved my life. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like driving on them, but I'm very grateful for rumble strips because just as with you, um, I'm alive today because of rumble strips. Because on my trauma surgery rotation in medical school, when you're running about 36 hours straight, and then you get one night to sleep, and then you run another 36 hours straight, and then you get a night to sleep, and then you run another 36 hours sleep and straight, I was driving home, and I got on the highway, and it was in Southern California, and there was probably eight lanes of traffic, and I was two lanes over from the, from the outside, and uh, I woke up going, Zzz. I was like, huh? And I was coming to an overpass. Mm. Concrete pylons and all that kind of stuff. Oh, correct. And get back. Oh, God, stay awake, stay awake, stay awake. Right? So I'm very grateful for rumble strips, but I don't like rumble strips. <laughs> their function is good, but their function is to be annoying on purpose. Right. So what happens if, from a health standpoint, we go beyond just symptoms and we keep getting away? Temperature keeps going higher. Where do you get to next? doctor. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. You end up with disease. Now you've got some real dysfunction that's going on. Maybe it's heat exhaustion, it's heat stroke, it's something of that nature that's really, uh, that's really now uncomfortable and you really have dysfunction and now maybe you're really motivated to do something about it. Uh, one of my colleagues, he worked in uh, he was in the military for a while, and he was part of the team that helped to take care of the military recruits who would pass out on their long <clears throat> marches and everything like that with their full fatigues and their packs, you know, 50-pound packs and everything like that, in the south with high humidity and high temperatures. And, of course, weren't drinking their water, and so they become dehydrated, and then the temperature starts going up, and all of a sudden if somebody falls out of line, the medics come along, check them out, temperature's 108, 109, sometimes 110 degrees. <clears throat> yeah, that's not good, not good at all. And so they rush them off to a center that they have set up for this, and they get a thermometer and stick it where nobody wants a thermometer to go, and uh, so that they can monitor their core temperature, they strip them down, they throw them into a tub of ice water, they stick two IVs in them with chilled ice uh, saline, and start running it and get their temperature down quick. Now, if that guy was healthy, or that girl was healthy when they went out, and they still feeling healthy at this time, you think they'd submit to all the ice water and everything like that? Uh -uh. No, thank you very much. But when you are really sick and you're really, you'll let people do stuff to you that you never would have before. <clears throat> and you might actually ask for help when you get far enough away. Well, the same happens in the opposite direction. You have chill lanes, frostbite, other things like that. Very painful, very uncomfortable. You really got to do something about it right away or else you're going to have real significant problems. But if you correct and get back within here, you're good. Now, what happens if we now do symptom care on a long-term basis? Now that we need to understand this, let's do symptom care on a long-term basis. Let's say that you have pain, pain somewhere. And that pain's been there for a week, two weeks, five weeks, ten weeks, a uh, hundred weeks. It's been a long time. And the, the treatment for the pain, of course, is, well, you have no meds, and now you take a medication for the pain. Ah, oh, okay, so you feel a little bit better. What happened to the road? All right, so no meds, on the med. No meds, on the med. No meds, on the med. What's that happening? Warning. Oh, yeah, it looks like the road's getting wider. But what happened to the law? <laughs> Not the same. Stay the same. Yeah, don't change, right? Right there. All right. So the law doesn't change. But, to your perception, the road appears to be wider. 
because it takes more before you start getting to the point of discomfort because of the pain medication that you're taking. Mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> and what happens if you take an even stronger medication? Well, it appears to be an even larger, right? <clears throat> so now you can drive off the road still thinking that you're on the road. And you don't have, it's like taking the rumble strips and moving the rumble strips farther and farther off the road. So you have a sense of security when there really isn't security and you don't have the warning signs when you shouldn't have the warning signs. Now, I'm not saying that people should not take something for, you know, that you shouldn't treat pain and, and, and that it's wrong to, to take pain medication, but I'll tell you that if you do it on a long-term basis, it'll take away your motivation to look for the cause. Mm -hmm. And you'll get farther and farther away without a strong motivation to do anything about it. And that can be dangerous. Because what happens if you go past disease? Where do you get to next? Death. Death. That's right, both ways. And yes, there's this gray zone where what I call the point of no return. You're still alive, and you're not getting back. And in my emergency department experience, I've seen that a number of times. Somebody's still alive yet, but they're not getting back. And, uh, and so we want to avoid that. And so some things along the way that help us to avoid that are things like symptoms and disease. The farther you go, the more discomfort you have in order to motivate you to do something about the cause. But if we have a system that simply tells us to treat the symptoms, then we don't even think about looking for the cause. Hmm. What else do we need? Water. <laughs> love. You need love? That's right. Is it possible that there's a law that governs love and that as long as we're within that law, things work fine, it's healthy, you have proper function, it's comfortable, and so on. But once you get outside of that law, you can end up with symptoms, disease, and even death. Possible? Yeah, I've seen it so many times. So health is proper function, which is the effect of staying within the law. And disease is dysfunction, which is the effect of going outside of the law. And symptoms and disease are like the fire alarm and the rumble strips. They're good. Now, we don't like them, but they have a good function. And the function is to let you know something's wrong, to do something about it. So, with law, we look at now the law of cause and effect, which tells us that every effect must have a cause, and every cause must produce an effect. And if the effect is present, then that means that the cause is also present, because if you take the cause away, what has to happen to the effect? It has to go away because it's not creating itself. It's not producing itself. There's something else that's doing the creating, producing, and so on. And when you take the creator producer thing away, that has to go away too. So no effect can produce itself because it is dependent upon power, materials, resources outside of itself in order to even exist or function. So you will never find an effect without a cause. You will never find an effect without a cause. There is always a cause for every effect. Mm -hmm. That means that there is no such thing as chance. Because, well, that's what chance is. Chance is having an effect without a cause. You just happen to have an effect without having a cause. Uh-uh. Will never happen. Has never happened. There's always a cause for every effect. And indeed, there's nothing that is truly random. Random is just our inability to comprehend what the outcome would be in a particular situation. Okay. <clears throat> so let's go microscopic. And after we go microscopic, we'll, we'll uh, give time for Q&A. So here's a set. You and I are made up of sets. We're, as adults, we have about 
50 to 100 trillion cells in our body. That's a lot. Um, and we have over 250 different types of cells in our body. And your function is dependent upon the function of each of those different types of cells. And cells function kind of like little factories. And of course, factories produce products. And so the cells produce products as well. And your function as a whole is dependent upon the function of each of the different types of cells. And if you lose a particular cell or a particular cell type, not just a single cell, but that type of cell, then you lose that function in your body as a whole. For example, uh, type 1 diabetes. In type 1 diabetes, you have a situation where the immune system begins picking off these cells in the pancreas called beta cells or beta islet cells. And those beta islet cells are the only cells in, in your body that produce insulin. insulin. That's right. And so if you knock out all of the insulin producing cells, guess what you don't have in the body? Insulin. Insulin. That's right. And then you die. Why do you die? You don't die because your sugar is so high. You don't. You die because your sugar is so low. And you're like, what? What are you talking about? Well, insulin is necessary in order for your cells to be able to take sugar into them so that they can have fuel. And now without the insulin, the cells can't take the sugar in, the sugar stays out, and the cells get depleted of the glucose that they need to operate. And yes, the sugar levels are really high in the bloodstream, but you don't die because the sugar is high in the bloodstream. You die because the sugar gets low, low, low inside the cells, and then they can't function. And there's all sorts of complications that come with it. But the cause, whatever the cause may be, will immediately begin to produce an effect. So let's say type 1 diabetes. The cause for type 1 diabetes comes to you right now. Well, it will start producing an effect right now. Right? But it may take time for the effect to get large enough for you to actually notice it. Um, it's generally believed, and I'm sure there's a bit of variation, but it's generally believed that you have to lose about half of a cell population before you start manifesting significant problems associated with whatever that thing is. You have to lose about half of your kidney cells before you start manifesting early signs of kidney failure or half of your liver cells before you start manifesting signs of liver failure and so on and so forth. So let's say that you started with 20 billion beta islet cells. How many would you have to lose before you actually started manifesting problems associated with it? About 10 billion. Now let's say that you, you start having the cause right now and right now it starts killing off 100 cells every second. 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 800, 900, 1,000, and so on. And at that rate, it keeps killing off beta islet cells. Well, that would kill off 6,000 cells in a minute, 360,000 in an hour, 8.6 million in a day, 60.5 million in a week, 260 million in a month, and 3.2 billion cells in a year. At that rate, it would take you three years and two months of the cause being in place before you had a manifestation of the effect that was big enough for you to notice it. But the entire time, the cause was there and the effect was being produced. It just wasn't big enough for you to see. So some disease processes are faster. I mean, it's, just, it's, it's quick. Some of them are slower. Some, it might be seconds, minutes, or hours between the cause being there and the manifestation being big enough for you to notice it. Others, it might be years or even decades. Type 2 diabetes, they estimate, is in place at least for 10 years. I mean, the process is usually in place at least for 10 years before an individual starts really manifesting problems with diabetes. So it can be a while, but this next slide is important. It's a really important one. Because if you want to know what the cause is, the cause has to meet this criteria. The cause must be in place before the effect was noticed. So I'm always interested, when I'm talking to patients, 
and my clients and so on, I'm always interested, when was the first symptom you had? So how old were you? Or when was that first symptom that you had? Why? Because I know that the cause had to be there before that time. And if there's anything that comes in their life after that time, that's not the cause. Can't be the cause. Because the cause had to be there before the very first symptom. Now, I don't know how long before exactly, but I know that it had to be before. And I also have to, I also know that if the effect is still present, then that means the cause is also present. As long as the effect is a process and disease is a process. So as long as the disease is still there, then the cause is still there. So when I'm looking for the cause, I need something in the life of the individual that was there before they had their first symptom and it is still there now, as long as the disease process is still going on. That's what you're looking for. Well, what if it was a chemical exposure? Okay, what if it was a chemical exposure and a one-time thing? If it was a chemical exposure and a one-time thing, then you would not have a continual process. Mm -hmm. Now, you can have injury. For example, you can cut off an arm or you can burn it in acid or you know, you have a chemical exposure to acid or other things like that. And you can, you can have, a, uh, you can have a, a damage that then comes to a point where you can't <laughs> fix it or heal it anymore, like cutting off your arm, we, we're not like salamanders and growing an extra arm. So you will have that permanent effect, but the effect is not a process, right? It doesn't continue to be a process. Once that healing is, is, is over, no, you don't have an arm anymore, and yes, that effect is permanent, but you don't have a continuing process going on. If after you cut the arm off and now there's a continuing process, there's something else that's there as the cause. Mm -hmm. So if the cause is removed, the effect must begin to go away. Now it might not go away right away because it might have been a process in the development and it can be a process and it's going away. Um, I just, the, I used to work at a lifestyle center in Alabama called Uchi Pines Institute. And um, I just got a message from our uh, lifestyle center administrator and he sent this through. It's always, it's always great to get these stories. We had a guest with stage four esophageal cancer with metastases to the spine five months ago. Just got a report today, five months later, cancer free. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. only did the lifestyle plan, kept up with the strawberries and the diet. And uh, another one we had recently, stage three colon cancer, primary tumors completely disappeared on follow-up imaging at the end of the session. So yeah, it's great. Once you get to the cause, then the effect begins to go away. Mm -hmm. Now, everything again functions according to that fundamental law, taking to give, including your cells. So your cells must take resources and they must take power in order to function. Just like an engine requires fuel and something to ignite the fuel. Now, if it's a gasoline system, then you're going to have gasoline as a fuel and a spark plug. And if it's a diesel system, well, you're going to have a gas. You're going to have diesel, and then the ignition is really going to be compression. But that compression has to have something of an electrical nature behind it to get it to compress, so that it'll ignite. So there's always something of a power nature and always something as a fuel nature that it needs, and it's true for living systems too. And so it's the cell that brings in the resources and the power that it needs, but it does so, everything takes to give, give. give, right? So it then produces things. The cell produces from what it takes. And it might produce uh, enzymes, it might produce hormones or autocrines, paracrines, cell signaling molecules, cell adhesion molecules, all sorts of stuff that it can, it can produce for the benefit of something else. And uh, the fuel or the raw materials for the cells is your oxygen, it's your water, it's your nutrients. These are chemicals. Chemicals function as the fuel for the cells. Right? And that fuel has to come in from the outside and it comes in through particular systems. So oxygen, of course, is going to come in through your respiratory system. 
The water and the nutrients are going to come in through your digestive system. Uh, warmth is going to be through your integumentary system. Right? You're going to lose it or gain it through the, through the skin and so on. Um, of course, muscles can, can generate uh, heat as well through shivering and its activity and, and so on. And so every system is involved in bringing in what you need. But how many cells of your body need oxygen? Not just your lungs, right? Your toes, your ears, your nose, right? They all need oxygen. So how are you going to get it from the lungs to everywhere else? Ah, all right. It's your bloodstream, right? So the blood is what carries the fuel to all of the different cells so that they can function. And if you cut off the blood supply to certain tissues or certain cells, well, it's not going to go well not going to go well. So if you want to be healthy, you've got to have good circulation. If the circulation's not good, you can't expect the cells to be doing well because they're just not getting the fuel that they need. And the cells need the nutrients and oxygen and water at certain <laughs> concentrations. And if the concentration is good, if the supply level is good, well, that's good. They can take what they need. But if there's too little, well, that's going to be a problem. And if there's too much, that's going to be a problem as well. You end up with deficiencies or toxicities in that case. But not only do the cells need resources or chemicals or fuel, the cells need power as well. They need that spark to get it going. So where or what form is that spark in? Well... Cells function by electricity as well. Right? So they function by chemicals as the fuel, but they function by electricity as the power. They are electric, electrochemical units. Right? And so the cells, the cell membrane will regulate positively and negatively charged molecules inside and outside of the membrane. It will have a resulting voltage difference. You can get a little voltometer, a voltmeter, and you can put one on the outside of the cell and one on the inside of the cell, and you can measure the voltage difference between the two. There's resistance to flow through the membrane, and when you open up those channels and those positively negatively charged particles go in and out, that's called current. Current, resistance, voltage, what's that? It's electricity, that's right. So the cells function as little electrical units with chemistry as its fuel, chemicals as its fuel. Where does the electricity come for the, each of the different cells in the body? Where's the origin of that in the individual? The brain. It's the brain. That's right, it's the brain. That's the origin for the power for the different cells of the body. Right? And every function in the body is regulated and coordinated through the brain. Your blood pressure is controlled here. Your respiratory rate is controlled here. Your uh, heart rate ultimately is controlled here. Now there's some auto regulation that goes on here as well, but much of the control is here. You, your, your chemistry levels, right? Your chemical levels in your bloodstream regulated up here. Your pH balance, regulated up here. Fluid levels, regulated up here. Kidney function, liver function, digestive function, all of it regulated from up here. Now, where does the nervous system, the brain, get the power from for it to function? The, the laws of thermodynamics tell us that all energy necessary for a system to function must come from where? Outside. outside that system. So the power necessary for the nervous system to function must come from outside the nervous system. Where does that come from? Well, some people say food or nutrients or other things. No, that's the fuel. Where does the spark come from? Okay. It comes from spiritual information. It comes from spiritual information. You see, <clears throat> love is a spiritual information. Mm -hmm. And love is a power. Mm -hmm. 
And that spiritual information, you and I, yeah, we're physical, but we also have a spiritual component as well. And we call that the spirit. Right? It's like a computer. A computer has hardware and it's got software. And hardware is not software and software is not hardware. But if you just have software, you've got nothing. And if you just have hardware, well, it's not going to function. You have something, you have to have something to drive or run the, the hardware, and that's what the software does. And if you separate the two, you've got nothing that functions. They only function when they come together. But when they come together, software has its components of function, and hardware has its components of function as well. And if you take a sledgehammer to the hardware, well, guess what? The whole system's not going to function very well. Even though the sledgehammer didn't damage the, the, the software, well, he's still not going to have a functional computer. And so, yes, you can damage the body by physical things, and you can destroy the whole individual from that standpoint. But you have a body, and you have a spirit, and they only function when they come together, but the spirit has its components of function, and the body has its components of function. And the spirit is in the lead. So that spiritual information, which you can't weigh, and doesn't have a chemical equation, and you don't have a density, and you can't me measure it under a microscope or anything of that nature, is brought in by the spirit, and that is made available to then the brain, the cortex of the brain, which then takes in that power. And of course, you know from, from, uh, from physics that power, when it goes from one thing to another, it changes its form, but it doesn't change the fact that it's power. You might go from potential energy to kinetic energy. You might go from hydro and gravity to electricity and so on and so forth, but it's still power. And so the power is made available to the cortex, which takes it in, passes it down the nerves. They then release chemicals that the cells take in, and that, that regulates the control of the cells and how they function. This is the mind. The mind is not just the brain. The brain itself cannot think. It's the brain and the spirit together, which is the mind, that can think. And what information does the mind need to function properly? Information of the law. OK. So it needs to be according to the law. How does the mind process information? Well, you process information based upon two alternatives. It's either truth or it's error. That's how we view and we process information, either as truth or as error. And when that information comes to the mind, there's an evaluation process. And at the end of the evaluation process, we either believe it to be truth, and if we do, or we believe it to be an error or a lie. Everything that we believe to be the truth, we accept and we take in. And everything that we believe to be a lie or an error, we reject. We don't take it in. That's the evaluation process that happens in an individual. But the question is, what is needed in order to do this evaluation process at all? If you're going to evaluate anything, what do you need? You have to have a standard. You have to have a standard by which you evaluate. So you've got to take something as the standard by which you then measure other things against to say, OK, does it fit? Does it not fit? And if you have a bad standard, what you're going to do is take truth, believe it to be a lie, and reject it. Take errors and believe it to be truth and accept it. And you'll be completely wrong. But what will you think you are? Right. Completely right. Because you're accepting everything you believe to be truth. And you're rejecting everything you believe to be a lie. Now, if you have a mixed standard, then you're going to end up with a mixed result, where you take some truth and believe it as truth and accept it, and other truth and believe it to be a lie and reject it, and you're going to take some error and believe it to be the truth and accept it, and other error to believe it to be a lie and reject it. Double-minded man, it sounds <laughs> So you're going to be partially wrong, but what will you think about yourself? You're perfectly right. You're perfectly right. That's right. 
Only if you have a perfect standard will you then take all truth as truth and accept it and all lies or error as lies and reject it. And then you actually would be correct and you would think you are correct. So the one who's completely wrong thinks that they're right. The one that's completely right thinks that they're right. The one that thinks that is partially right and partially wrong thinks that they're co correct. Welcome to relationships. <laughs> oh, <holy. laughs> Help <us> Jesus. <laughs> Welcome to relationships. So <clears throat> that spiritual information that we function by correctly is truth. And when truth is what the spirit takes in and makes available to the body through this process, it will result in proper control of the function of the cells and tissues and organs and so on through this pathway of the mind. But if the foundation of that spiritual information is error, and that is what the spirit takes in, believing that it's the truth, and that is what's made available to the the brain and through the nervous system to the different cells of the body, then that's going to result in dysfunction. That'll result in dysfunction. So through this pathway of the mind, you can end up with all sorts of chaos happening in the body. All sorts of chaos happening in the body because of what's happening in the mind through this pathway. Now this is not the only way that the body can end up dysfunctional. It's not the only way. Tomorrow, we're going to tease that apart and say, okay, well, how do you, how do you know whether it's one or the other? And we're going to go there. We're going to look at the deceptions of healthcare and, and so on. Um, and, and whatever. So, again, if we've got symptoms, that's not the problem. That's not the problem. The problem is much deeper than that. So we've got to look at our sources. We've got to understand what we believe because that will affect how we behave. Our needs will never change. That's governed by law, and that doesn't change. So, if we're ever going to be healthy, well, and so on, and we're talking physical health tonight, but we're going to be talking mental health, and we're going to be talking relationships and so on later as we get through uh, to tomorrow and Saturday and so on. Um, and believe me, we're going to get deep. We're going to get deep. We need to understand how we function. Because if we don't understand that, we're never going to understand how to cooperate in the process of regaining function of what we've lost. Now, with that, any questions? Yes. I don't have a question, I have a comment. Okay. Um, I'm a cancer survivor, and when I first went to my oncologist, I had a specific question, what caused this type of cancer? And his words were, I don't, I don't know. know. I don't have a crystal ball, I don't know. And I'm thinking, I know cause to effect, I gotta find the cause. Mm -hmm. And after a lot of research, we think we found it, but he just didn't have a clue. Yeah. It was, it was like, we don't know, it just happened. Right. Yes, no, doctors don't know the cause of disease. They don't. So how do you correct something that you don't know the cause of? Yes, it's the practice. Keep practicing. It's the practice of medicine. That's right. That's right. So, uh, yes. I was never diagnosed with uh, diabetes before. I had an accident in 2012, almost died. I came 10 minutes away. And this past year, I've, I've been awfully tired. We always thought, well, maybe it's just, you know, from the accident, still trying to catch up, which was dumb. But anyway, I went to the doctor. They drew blood. They said, you've got stage two. Mm -hmm. um, Diabetes. Type 2 diabetes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I said, what do we do about it? Well, you can handle it with a medicine. We'll give you a pill. <laughs> yeah, all right. Okay. And you can handle it with food. Mm -hmm. I'm doing no good on food. Uh, the medicine, I don't know if it's doing any good or not. But could that accident 
have been what caused the diabetes? There's a possibility. If with the accident you had trauma to the pancreas, and the trauma was significant enough, then, um, then yes, that might be a contributing factor, right? Uh, it's not the only factor, because you have, you have a healing process that should be able to do some restoration. Yeah. Right? Uh, so there's something else also that's going on. And when you have an accident, you don't only have an accident of a physical nature to the individual. It affects the mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because then there might be fear uh, that comes because of that. Uh, if we perceive someone else at fault in relation to the accident, then there can be resentment or bitterness or other things of that nature. Or if we perceive ourselves as at fault with the accident, then there can be guilt and other things of that nature that we, uh, that we start holding on to with it. And so accidents don't just affect the physical body, they affect the mind as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other questions? <coughs> All right, um, much, uh, not all, and things have been developing over time, but anyways, um, much of what we're gonna be discussing through this time is in the Law of Life book. Um, it essentially is a transcript of, uh, of a, a, a slightly earlier transcript of, of this series. Um, and, um, and if anybody's interested in that, my wife's got it back there in the back. The plant-based for life starter kit. Um, it's basically a, a very quick, um, you know, if you are interested in being healthy and your diet being a component of that, like a plant-based diet, which is the research shows very clearly is the best choice for any type of disease or trying to avoid disease. Um, and yet a lot of people have questions. What do I do about protein? And what do I do about calcium? And how am I gonna get this and that and the other thing? Well, the Plant-Based for Life Starter Kit answers those questions, talks about what, you know, what's available in the food that you eat. And then uh, towards the back of it, um, you know, my wife uh, and I were trying to plan for uh, individuals that have a busy schedule, they don't necessarily have all of the time to uh, cook and prepare and do all of that kind of stuff. And so we put together uh, basically a two-week health maintenance plan uh, with menu uh, and all of that kind of stuff with all the recipes in the back as well um, of different plant-based dishes. And before you begin, you know, two days before you're going to start this, go shopping and get these things. And the day before you're going to begin, uh, cook and, and these things and set it aside. And on this day, you're going to pull this out of the refrigerator and this out of the freezer and you're going to put it together and make this and, and so on. For individuals that can't really cook during the day, they might be working and busy and all that kind of stuff. That's with that in mind. Um, so if you're interested in that, it's in the back and I can't remember. <coughs> And then, of course, the girls have made all sorts of stuff. Salves and lotions and lip balm and soy candles and soaps and other things like that. And, and uh, so if you want to, yeah, the, the kids are very happy to be involved. All right, if you don't have other questions, I'm going to pray and let you go. Yes? Well, there's one thing that we're going to do, too, this kind of a that point is that you know the things that are becoming more and more to start up kind of like a, a, a support group for the community. Because obviously when you're making changes of any kind, or it's mental, physical, or, or, or diet changes, we want to be able to help each other and support one another that making those changes and have a desire to do that. Like learning how to cook new things, I know I learned a lot of things myself. So this kind of a thing we'll kind of be talking ever so often throughout the program. We want to have a support group to help each other do these things. And, and change our habits that we've cultivated for long periods of time. Oh yes, and the other thing I forgot, the sign-up sheet's right over there. Cool. On the, uh, 
Yeah, right over there. Um, so if anybody wants more, you know, information, resources, other things like that, um, you know, be able to contact us, counseling, um, consultations, other things of that nature, web resources, and, and so on, um, then, um, then there's a sign-up sheet on the corner of that glassy thing right over there. Um, for those that want to, we probably should have passed it around tomorrow. All right, I'm gonna pray, let you go. And then tomorrow at six, we're gonna pick up from here and we're just gonna get deeper and deeper as we go along. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your blessings. Thank you for uh, laws that are the same all the time. And um, teach us more how we're made, how we function, why we dysfunction the way that we do, and what we can do in the process of cooperating to regain that function. And, uh, and Lord, if it's the body that's messed up, well, we need help there. If it's the mind that's messed up, well, we need help there. If it's the relationships that's messed up, well, we need help there. And you have help sufficient for it. And we thank you for that. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.